Hello doctors, this is your online medical educator. Today we are going to cover a quick review on acute appendicitis. Appendicitis is thought to start when the appendiceal lumen is blocked. At least in some cases. In this case, obstruction causes bacteria to grow and the lumen to become dilated, which can make it difficult for lymph and blood to flow freely. Inflammation of the appendix is linked to fecaliths, partially digested food leftovers, lymphoid hyperplasia, intraluminal scarring, tumors, bacteria, viruses, and inflammatory bowel disease. Nonspecific complaints start out first. A patient may notice changes in their bowel habits or feel ill. They may also have vague, crampy abdominal pain in the epigastric or periumbilical area. Afterward, the pain moves to the right lower quadrant over the next 12 to 24 hours. It is sharper and can be pinpointed as transmural inflammation when the appendix irritates the parietal peritoneum, which is where the pain comes from. Parietal peritoneal irritation may cause muscles in the area to become rigid and stiff. Patients who have appendicitis will usually notice that their nausea, if any, comes after they have abdominal pain. This can help you tell them apart from people who have gastroenteritis, for example, where nausea comes first. After the pain starts, emesis, if there is any, usually comes and goes quickly and is mild and slight. People who have appendicitis can't be found by lab tests. The white blood cell count is only slightly to moderately high in about 70% of people who have simple appendicitis. Serum levels of amylase and lipase should be checked. Urinalysis is done to rule out genitourinary problems that could be mistaken for acute appendicitis. A few red or white blood cells may be found as a nonspecific sign. If the appendix is inflamed, it could cause sterile puria or blood in the urine. When a doctor is concerned about something else, he or she will get a plain film of the abdomen. This is not done unless the doctor is concerned about something else, like intestinal obstruction, perforated viscous, or ureterolithiasis. Ultrasound is a good tool for diagnosing appendicitis, but how well it works depends on the person who is using it. Ultrasound, especially intravaginal techniques, may be the best way to find pelvic problems in women. Ultrasonography can show signs of appendicitis, like thick walls, a bigger appendiceal diameter, and free fluid. Current practice in many places is to start with ultrasonography and only move on to other imaging tests if the results aren't clear. CT scanning is a better way to figure out how bad an acute appendicitis is if there are no signs in the peritoneum of a perforation, an abscess, or a possible malignancy. CT scans may show that the appendix is dilated more than 6 mm, the walls are thicker, and the lumen doesn't fill with enteric contrast. This suggests that the appendix is inflamed. Most people who have strong medical histories and physical examinations with supportive lab results are good candidates for appendectomy if there aren't any other reasons not to do it. All patients should be well prepared for surgery and have any fluid and electrolyte imbalances fixed before going in for it. Patients with uncomplicated appendicitis can have either a laparoscopic or an open appendectomy, but most procedures are done in a way that isn't very painful. People who have a mass that looks like a phlegmon or abscess can make it more challenging to treat them. The best way to help these people is to give them broad-spectrum antibiotics, drain an abscess that is more than 3 cm in diameter, and give them parenteral fluids and bowel rest if they don't seem to be getting better on their own. The appendix can then be removed more safely 6 to 12 weeks later when the inflammation has gone down. That's all for today. See you in the next review.